This is a uh, diary of an archaeologist talk. Um, this was an initiative that was started quite a number of years ago now um, with the uh, UNE Archaeology Society as a way for uh, students to hear the sorts of things um, that archaeologists, um, students, as well as academics in the department and visitors um, were doing just so they could get a feel for what um, archaeological practice is like. Okay, so can you all see my my PowerPoint? We good to go? Yes, I see it in some right. more. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, so the uh, way we're going to do this talk um, tonight is I'm going to do this introduction and give a background for the workshop and also just sort of a, a introduction into the archaeology of the Pacific and how ADS fit into that, because I know we don't actually teach a Pacific archaeology class at UNE. Um, actually, Martin and I, Professor Gibbs, were uh, uh, talking the other day that maybe it's time to start one. But in any case, I know that there might not be a great deal of uh, knowledge and background about Pacific archaeology. So I'll, I'll give a brief introduction on the archaeology of the Pacific and how ADS particularly focused on how ADS fit into that. Um, once I've given you that background information, I'm going to turn over to um, three of our UNE students who are going to talk about their experiences on this workshop, uh, different aspects, um, just unpacking what we did um, for a few short discussions and, and hopefully some really nice photos um, of what we got up to uh, during this trip to Samoa. And then at the end, I'm going to um, talk again about more specifically about the ads making and some of the insights that we had um, that we gained through uh, doing this uh, particular exercise. Okay, the, the genesis of this project, um, Steve, um, Steve and Percival is actually in our audience tonight, which is a great honor because if it wasn't for him, this project wouldn't have happened. He was the catalyst for it. He uh, um, got the funding uh, to the uh, allowed us to uh, travel over there and uh, participants to travel to Samoa and also he, his uh, skills at, at uh, just hurting all these different people and organizing all these events um, were just amazing. So uh, hats off to Steve. This couldn't have happened without him. Um, now Steve is the director of the Tia Papata Art Center um, and it's based in Apia Samoa and that's um, where we did uh, that was our sort of central base for where we ran the, the workshop. Now, I'd encourage you, if you uh, do travel to Samoa, to stop in and have a look at the art center. Um, it's bed and breakfast as well, and it's just absolutely stunning location. Um, I put some QR codes in there for you to have a look at uh, the Tia Papata Art Center. Um, and the genesis of the project, second, was... Um, if this is the story as I remember it, Steve can correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe Steve was, was traveling internationally, um, as part of a cultural embassy from Samoa. And he had a holdover in the, the airport in Brisbane and he stumbled across the museum of stone tools, which I had only recently launched. Um, one thing led to another, Steve called me up and said, you know, would, would you want to come over and, and do some stone working? Uh, with us here in Samoa um, and uh, work with making stone adzes. And of course I said, yes, that would be absolutely brilliant. So it was about, it took uh, another oh, six or eight months before it finally got off the ground. Um, but that was the genesis of the project. For those of you who are not familiar with the Museum of Stone Tools, I've put some uh, QR codes in there that, that you can have a look at what we do. Now, my particular specialty, um, for those of you who don't know, I'm a, a professor at the University of New England, and my particular specialty is stone tools, um, analyzing stone tools using archaeological methods, and also replicating and making stone tools. I taught myself over a number of years the skills at making stone tools. So um, that was one of the reasons why uh, Steve uh, called me up and suggested this workshop. Now, what was the workshop? Um, again, this is uh, uh, Steve's brainchild. He's uh, developing a, a series of workshops that are called Rock, Paper, Scissors. Now, the Tia Papata Art Center um, 
one of the uh, goals of the art center is the, the restoration of arts and crafts no longer widely practiced or understood in Samoa. Um, and the first cab off the ranks of uh, some of, one of the things he wanted to look at was uh, making the traditional Samoan stone adzes. Um, Steve has been doing that for a number of years, um, but hasn't been using entirely traditional techniques to do that. And uh, just in our discussions, he thought it would be a good idea to uh, push that a little bit further and try to relearn some of those traditional techniques with the eye of developing perhaps a market for uh, uh, for marketing these ads um, as tourist items or prestige items, um, but also just to to kind of reconstruct and, and uh, revitalize that aspect of uh, uh, Samoan traditional culture. Um, another aspect of the workshop that I believe might be upcoming is uh, looking at Siapo, which is the uh, the traditional uh, paper that was made in Samoa. You might know it better as tapa cloth that's uh, uh, found across wide parts of the Pacific, made from the bark of mulberry trees. So that's a, another aspect of the ongoing workshop in this series. Um, and also, I believe they may be doing a, a clay, um, doing pottery making as well. So what the rock refers to stone tools, the paper refers to siapo, and scissors is sort of a metaphor for um, equipment and methods um, that people would use uh, to practice these things traditionally. Now, um, the funding for this came from the European Union. Uh, Steve was able to uh, apply for an arts grant from the European Union for the Pacific area and uh, was successful with that application. So those are the, our um, funding bodies there, the Pacific Community and the uh, ACPEU. So I want to acknowledge um, their generous funding for this project. So the workshop program, um, we had about 18 per uh, participants. Um, it was it was uh, kind of informal participation. So there are people chopping and changing. So it was hard to get, difficult to get an exact count because it changed uh, from day to day because a lot of these people had busy lives and they had to go out and do other things and they come back and and take part in other aspects of the workshop. Um, but you can see the the breakdown there of where people were from, primarily uh, Samoans, but we we did have people from. Uh, New Zealand, and of course, us, us Australians as well. And one person came over from the United States. And uh, uh, 14 of the participants were from Pacifica background. They had cultural heritage uh, somewhere in the Pacific. Um, one of the major elements of the workshop, it wasn't all just sitting around breaking rocks. It was also an educational thing um, where Steve took us out uh, to different uh, parts of Samoa, um, to uh, see cultural heritage side and to meet people and to see some of the, um, the traditional practices and different elements of uh, that we used then uh, for the stone uh, ads making workshop, the Senate making, string making, things like that. Um, and also, we also found time to, to do the beach and go to markets. Um, Mary Ann's going to talk uh, about Umu, that's the traditional method of cooking. We're going to hear a talk from here, her shortly about that. Uh, and we also, it, it happened to be a very important period in the uh, Baha'i calendar. So we went to a couple of Baha'i services um, as well as part of this. Um, presentations. Um, we did a number of presentations, uh, myself and Steve and others, um, in an, a, quite a few different contexts as part of the outreach aspect of this workshop. Um, and you can see the list there. Um, the UN, uh, UNESCO International Museums Day and the UNESCO World Day for Cultural Diversity for Dialogue and Development, um, those were hosted at Tia Papata Art Center. And we actually had some uh, um, dignitaries show up for that. The uh, uh, High Commissioner uh, for Australia to Samoa came for, for one of those. We had the uh, a representative was sent by the minister uh, for uh, culture and arts in Samoa. Um, there, was, there was also um, the uh, head of the um, Museum of National Museum of Samoa gave a little presentation at one of those talks. Um, we had uh, the former head of state uh, for Samoa um, came for, for one of those presentations as well. 
and also um, one of a uh, very important person in the UN um, came and gave a talk at one of these. So it was very much outward reaching, but also networking up into those higher echelons of government. Um, so it wasn't just sitting around and breaking rocks. We also went out to a school, gave a long presentation to a school, and we had a children's day at Tia Papata as well. So we had uh, outreach to uh, kids of various ages as well, uh, primary and secondary school. Okay. And one thing that, sorry, I'm having trouble seeing my screen because of the, this. Let me just hide the meeting controls. One aspect of the talk or the project was we did a lot of 3D modeling. And that was an aspect of the workshop that I'm not going to talk about today. We don't, we had to cut the line somewhere. Um, but that might be a, a subject that we can talk about in the future, how we use 3D modeling in the process of the workshop. But the primary part that I'm going to be talking about today is the stone coring and flaking activities, the core of, of the workshop. All right. So what did we do? What, what was the goal for us in this workshop? Well, the goal was to make Samoan stone ads as using traditional methods, all right? Um, focusing on the stone, but also hafting the stone onto handles. So there's five different aspects to uh, producing one of those. And we were trying to do all of those different five aspects, keeping in mind that uh, uh, nobody has been uh, stone flaking on Samoa. There's an archeologist who was there in the 1980s in American Samoa, and he did some replication experiments. Um, but prior to that, uh, Samoan stoneworking um, was sort of disappeared around the early 1800s, okay? So we had to rediscover a lot of this ourselves, uh, the practical aspects. Plus I did a, a really deep literature review to uh, see what archeologists had uh, uh, suggested was going on in the prehistory in Samoa in these different areas. So these were the five things that we were looking at, stone procurement, um, the actual flaking of the, the stone that we got into adzes, grinding the cutting edges on the adzes, uh, handle manufacture, uh, creating the wood handle, and then of course, affixing the stone um, to the wooden handle. So why stone adzes? You know, what's the big deal about stone adzes? Well, to archaeologists, since I'm speaking to an archaeology audience, I'm going to focus quite a bit on the archaeology. Um, the archaeological importance of stone adzes is, is super high. It's because uh, the Pacific archaeology has uh, long been of interest to archaeologists. And before um, archaeologists had things like radiocarbon dating, and before they had sourcing of stone and, and all these modern techniques that we use today, uh, one of the key aspects of the data that they could look at and compare between islands was the styles of the stone tools, in particular the stone adzes. And so there's a really deep history of interest in uh, stone adzes amongst archeologists and ethnographers as well. But to uh, Samoan people today, there's still a, a strong cultural connection back uh, to those stone adzes. And if you look at those images in the lower left, you, you see a stone adze there, uh, that was made by uh, Steve. Um, and next to it is is a uh, ads that was used, is still used at the Tia Papata Art Center by uh, some of the uh, the workmen there. Um, and you can see it's it's uh, hafted in the same way, but it's got a metal a metal piece in there. But there's still that cultural connection of using the ads, which is very different sort of um, way of using woodworking tools and say uh, what uh, us Westerners might be more familiar with, with hatchets and axes. Um, and that cultural connection back, uh, right back from the, the steel as is that they use today, right back to stone is still there. All right. And then the other thing is visibility. Stone adzes pop out of these gardens um, all across uh, Samoa. And uh, people are um, uh, very familiar with, with finding these objects. Um, that uh, photo on the right, um, Steve took us out to um, a plantation, and that's that's the adzes that have been collected on this, um, the gardening areas in this plantation uh, over the years. All right, so you can see that that there's a lot of adzes out there. I might just, uh, I'll try not to to get distracted too much, but I might uh, talk about this. That there was a um, a person in, in the government, uh, minis, uh, administrator of some kind of New Zealand, who back in the 1980s, he thought it would be a good idea to make an ads collection uh, from Samoa. 
and he gave lollies to children to go out and find him ads. He was there for a few years, um, and when he left, he took all of his ads with him, um, and there were over 700 ads that he had collected from these children by giving them uh, candy to bring him these, these stone ads. And that, that is an astronomical density because he says they are uh, primarily from two villages. Um, and that density of woodworking tools is, is quite staggering. Um, I can't think of anywhere in Australia where you would go and find uh, 700 stone axes, for instance, in such a confined area as that. So and they're very visible artifact types uh, as a reminder of, of uh, prehistory in Samoa. And uh, incidentally, that, that um, collection of 700 ads is now in a museum in uh, New Zealand. Um, and I believe the National Museum of Samoa might have um, 40 ads in their collection. So yeah, um, Samoans are keen to get um, these ads back. Okay, now I'm just gonna quickly go over the, the archeology span um, of the ads and uh, I'll try to speed up a little bit because we have a lot to get through. So it all begins with Foster Indonesian expansion. This is the colonization of the Pacific. Uh, it began with people from China. They entered into uh, uh, the Philippines by about 4,200 years ago. Um, part of the group of Austronesians uh, moved off into Indonesia and as far as Madagascar, actually. Um, but another segment of this, this colonizing population moved um, through the Philippines, um, across the Mariana Islands, and through the Bismarck Archipelago um, by about uh, 3,200 years ago. A lot of interactions with people in uh, Papua New Guinea. In the Bismarck Archipelago, the, this uh, culture called the Lapita um, arose, partly through those interactions uh, through that region, through the Bismarck Archipelago and the Solomon Islands uh, about 3,200 years ago. Um, and then the Lapita culture started spreading eastward. Um, reaching New Caledonia about uh, 3,200 is pretty rapid spread, and finally arriving in Samoa by about 2,800 BP, okay? So about 2,800 years ago. Lapita culture, you may know this from your textbooks, is well known in particular for highly decorated pottery, um, but we're going to talk about adzes. When the Lapita culture arrived in Samoa, there was this thing that... Uh, um, archaeologists refer to as the long pause. There's about a 1600 year pause in the expansion across the Pacific from about 2,500 to 900 years ago. Um, so there's a break in contact between the islands. There's intermittent contact. They weren't totally isolated, but there are long periods of um, isolation in there. And archaeologists have said that the birth of Polynesian culture was in Samoa, Tonga, and some of the other smaller archipelagos in that area. That was where Polynesian culture, as we know it today, um, you can really identify a lot of the elements of Polynesian culture back to that region in that time period. Um, and just uh, pottery was abandoned by about a thousand years ago in Samoa because their, their cooking, the way they cooked and stuff changed pretty dramatically. Um, and Marianne's going to talk about uh, traditional cooking culture. So after that long pause, um, that was our next wave of colonization of um, the far parts of the Pacific, uh, the remote Pacific started. Um, there's been some dates come out recently that suggest that um, the timeline was much more constricted than uh, some of the previous research has suggested. I think these dates are relatively controversial, but um, the paper was in PNAS, which is pretty, pretty high, highly uh, esteemed journal. So around a thousand years ago, people left the Samoa Tonga area and arrived on the Society Islands. There's a pause there of between uh, 70 and almost 300 years. They're not sure of the timing there. But then after that pause, it seems like the rest of the Pacific was colonized by people from the Cook Islands, Society Islands. Um, so you can see around 1200 um, AD is the rest of the Pacific was colonized. Okay, so that's your background colonization of the Pacific. But now we'll get into the ads. So ads, um, when the people arrived in Samoa during that long pause, there was a huge amount of innovation um, in their stone technology, in particular their ads. This is the way that the ads looked when they arrived, okay? 
they were, um, had a lenticular cross-section, lens-shaped cross-section, and a centered cutting edge. That particular edge that you can see there was actually found on Samoa. It's not dated, but it's suspected that it dates to the, the very earliest colonization of Samoa because it's that Lapidus-style ads. Now, just uh, to clarify the difference between an ads and an axe, okay? Um, you can see there, I've got, these are um, uh, screen captures of 3D models. You can see them on the Museum of Stone Tools. Um, you can see with an axe or a hatchet, the cutting edge is in line with the handle, whereas with an adze, it's at right angles to the handle. And that makes a big difference in the way that the stone tool is used. So um, seeing the way that Lapita, um, we call it an adze, but it actually morphologically looks more like an axe. Um, there definitely were Lapita adzes, um, but I'm thinking that possibly here in Samoa, you tended to see axes drop out entirely and in, in all the woodworking then was done with this ads morphology. The ads innovation in Samoa during that long pause focused on the cross section in particular of the stone tools. Now, and I'll get into great depth of this later, um, probably my second talk about how the ads were made. But for right now, just look at those cross sections. Um, you can see on the right, I've taken a, some of our 3D models and cut them in half. And the red shaded area is giving you the cross section where the line bisects the ads. And you can see that top one is trapezoidal. The black dots are where the platforms are from where the flakes were struck off, flat on the bottom, two sloped sides, okay? Um, almost 90% of the ads is in, in uh, Samoa were that trapezoidal shape. Triangular ads is, those had three platform edges, okay? One down the crest on the back of the ads, and then two on the sort of those lower corners of the ads. And then also about 10% were those, and then about another 10% were rectangular, where you had actual uh, flaked edges on all four uh, corners of the ads. And I'll talk about more about that uh, later. Archaeologists have broken these ads into about 10 ads types, plus subtypes, plus intermediate types between those subtypes, and also on classifiable specimens. This is what archaeologists tended to do, particularly back in the, the 50s, 60s, uh, even before that, is divide the material culture into types and track the types across space and time. I'll come back to that later, but there's a great deal of research has been done on the Samoan ads. Here are some examples of the trapezoidal adzes in hafts. Those ones in the up, the two in the upper left are from the Field Museum of Natural History in Chicago. The one on the right is a hafted adze in uh, um, New Zealand, Te Papa. But the ones down on the lower left, those were actually collected by that New Zealand guy. Um, you can see that trapezoidal cross section with the sloped insides, kind of flat on top, but narrower on the top than the underside that you can't see in those photos. So that's a classic trapezoidal ads. Now, trapezoidal ads is, uh, remember that spread? Um, there was that long pause in Samoa, that ads innovation. These trapezoidal ads is were invented there. And then they spread with the people as they moved out across the Pacific. There's the Samoan style ads, exactly the same type of ads in the Society Islands. Uh, Marquesas, again, trapezoidal ads. That's from Pitcairn. I don't have a, a side views on that one, but you can see um, that's that got that same trapezoidal morphology. And here we go to uh, New Zealand. Again, trapezoidal ads. So the idea of a trapezoidal ads spread with the people across the Pacific, originated in, in um, Samoa and spread from there. Um, this particular one is thought to actually be made of stone from Samoa. Nobody's actually been able to uh, confirm that or not, but um, it's from uh, Micronesia, quite a ways to the north where they didn't have any stone on the atolls up there. And it's remarkably similar to an ads that has been found on Samoa. That's from the Facebook page of the Museum of Samoa um, that was found uh, somewhere, uh, I'm not entirely sure, somewhere on, in Samoa. And uh, you can see it's almost an identical match to the one from uh, Micronesia. Okay, so people left Samoa, they colonized these new islands, but when they arrived in those places, they found local stone sources on a lot of those islands. And over the course of generations, they started innovating new aspects to the stone adzes. So these are all unique um, to these 
other island chains, uh, the technological innovations that occurred there didn't backflow to Samoa. Samoa, they continually made those trapezoid lodges. All these other innovations happened after people left um, Samoa. So you can see on the Cook and Society Islands, they started producing tangs on their adzes, and they innovated a technique called hammer dressing, which I'll get, get to uh, later. Um, Hawaiian Islands. Um, you can see it's got a rectangular cr uh, cross section to these adzes, and they started doing a lot more of that quadrangular work, working on, on square sectioned objects, and they used a technique called indirect percussion to do that. Um, New Zealand, okay? Again, um, they had trapezoid lads, we saw in that, that previous slide, but added on to that were these all these other different uh, morphologies. Again, made by hammer dressing, indirect percussion, same as in Hawaii, the hammer dressing from the Cook Islands, tang adzes, very complex uh, technologies arose in New Zealand for adzes, but they all had their roots in that Samoan trapezoid lads. Also, uh, I'll just mention this, um, another ads innovation uh, in New Zealand was to make um, adzes out of nephrite. And the way they do that is they would saw uh, curves into the nephrite and saw from both sides and then snap it. Um, because you can't nap the stuff, you can't hammer dress it. Um, it's the only way that you can really work this stuff. But man, it makes a good sharp edge. Another thing that happened with adzes, um, on, on different island groups, different archipelagos through the Pacific, is they were imbued with a lot of cultural um, uh, meaning. They became sacred. Um, the classic example of that are these um, adzes from the Cook Islands. Uh, these are not made to be used, obviously. These ones were um, only taken out on very special occasions, and these are uh, considered manifestations of different ancestor gods. Um, you can see that incredibly ornately uh, carved handle, and also the 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 way that the ads is lashed on there has a lot of meaning as well. And you had similar sort of thing happening in New Zealand, where um, these uh, toki pau tangadas um, were carried as uh, a sign of chiefly uh, influence. And you can see the historic image there of a of a chief in in all his regalia, and he's carrying that that toki pau tangada is a symbol of that. Okay. So that's enough about adzes to give you a bit of an archaeological and sort of a historical and cultural background on adzes. I'm now going to turn over to the, the students um, to uh, do their, their talks, and then we'll loop back around, and uh, I'll talk again at the end about what we've learned from this workshop. So at this stage, I believe I'm turning over to Georgina. Is that correct? Yep. Fantastic. Thanks, Mark. We'll just swap our screens. Okay, how's that look for everyone? Yep. Good. All right. Ooh, let me, there we go. Okay, um, so for my talk this evening, um, I will be talking about Tatungama Tau and hiking the ancient trail to the site of Tatungama Tau. So it, it's pronounced Tatungama Tau, and it was probably a record number of times that the name of this site has been spoken because I think at some point we were all rehearsing Tatungama Tau over and over, and I remember it became something like an earworm. Um, at night trying to fall asleep thinking ta tanga matau. Um, so in my talk tonight, I'm going to briefly share our experiences of climbing through the jungle to the site of ta tanga matau. So it's an ancient quarry site on the American Samoan island of Tutuila. The material at the site is oceanic basalt and there are masses, masses of flakes all across the mountain. This was a place where generations of tool makers were napping ads blanks. The site is located in Leone village and is a very significant heritage site to the people of Leone. For a bit of context, um, it was day two of the Samoa trip. We went on a little plane you can see here um, from Samoa to American Samoa. 
we were told that we would be taken to an ancient quarry and getting to the summit would be quite a treacherous journey as there'd been torrential rain uh, the, the day before and that morning. So the hike would be very slippery. We really weren't aware of what we were in for in terms of the terrain and to our great delight, the magnitude of archaeological materials at Tatanga Matau. So uh, when we landed in American Samoa, we were loaded into utes. Um, straight out of the airport, we met Epi. Epi is the first Samoan female archaeologist. This is a photo of um, Epi and her husband, Lalawasi, taken later in our trip. Um, it was largely through the work of Epi and her husband, Lalawasi, that we were able to get access to Tatanga Matau and gain insight into history of the location. So uh, when we met Epi, she said that Lalawasi was already at Tatanga Matau waiting for us. Um, Epi drove Zach, Marianne and myself to our first stop, which was breakfast. And I distinctly remember Epi saying, like the car, you need fuel before you do anything. And it was from this first interaction that I knew we were all going to get along very well with Epi. But I'll, I'll say a bit more about Epi at the end. When we arrived at the base of the hike, Epi explained that there were two ways up. There was a perilous shortcut or the ancient trail, which sloped gradually up to the quarry. And we took the ancient trail. We were taken up by guides. Um, I can't remember if they were from national parks or, but they were from some organization like that. Um, and I remember the jungle was literally looming above above us. It was proper jungle. And I distinctly remember Marianne saying, we should swing on the vines, which sounded like a lot of fun and a easier way to get up the slope. Um, but if, if only it was that easy. It was a very short way up the track that we started seeing evidence of the quarry. As we walked, I was seeing flakes everywhere. These are some photos that Mark took. It's hard to actually describe um, the, these and the density of flaking debris at Tatanga Matau. The photo in the bottom right taken by Mark, um, that sort of shows the density. Uh, all of the, the stone you see there are flakes. And this continued up to the main section of a quarry. As this sort of visualization shows. We start at the bottom there beside a creek and immediately we saw initial quarrying um, and further up more densely visible industrial scale flaking there. You can see dates for those here. And just as a comparison, you can see an example from Hawaii. All of that there um, is free of vegetation and all of the gray there is a flake. So that's potentially what this site could have looked like. And so we're only at the first 100 metres of this climb. We came to a ridge and then a dugout, which was full of water. Now, archaeologists have suggested that this ridge um, was designed as a fortification, as there was an extensive ads trade occurring around 1000 AD, and then conflict with Tongans may have led to fortifying this quarry due to its resources. Um, and you can see it here, Zach looking at the, the treacherous hike ahead. Um, most people stopped here because the terrain was just too intense and required a lot of strength to pull yourself up the rest of the way. And this is where we were aiming to get anyway. So some of us did not stop there. For me, probably, one of the most memorable moments of climbing this ridge uh, was this second part when Marianne and Zach went far ahead with the guides and Mark and I lagged behind because I was taking out all the stuff from my pack because it was just so heavy. And then we continued up a bit and Mark said no, he couldn't do it anymore. He called it and went, went back and told me that I should continue. So there was a brief moment um, on the side of the hill in the jungle where I couldn't see any guides and there I didn't know where I was going. So I followed marks where people like had slipped or snapped a branch and eventually found the others at the summit. 
At the summit, there was a noticeable change in the flaking density. We found several flakes initially, but it sloped away on the other side. Um, the quality of rock changed dramatically to stone that was completely unsuitable for napping. I've, um, it was fascinating to see this geology so starkly contrasted, and it really made me understand just how important a resource that the basalt was and is because of its quality. And another great moment was the slide back down. That's a whole other story, but in hindsight, it was a lot of fun to be with Mary and Zach as we would slide down and we'd find another huge bank of flakes. We'd chat about it and get all excited about what we were going to tell Mark when we all got back together. And then we'd face another slide down the hill. We repeated that with, there were several scary moments in between that, but the flaking, seeing those flaking, um, the flaking debris was incredible. Then, uh, because we were all so muddy, we washed off in the little stream at the base of the hike. And as I was washing my boots, I picked up a nice little ads blank. I'm happy to say that we all made it back, covered in mud, and our most strenuous adventure was mostly complete. Uh, this The day two of Tatung Matau was a bit different. We didn't have the difficult hike that the first day um, that we had in the first day, but we had a lot more mud. Epi gave us information about the section that we were going to that day. So our mission that day was to find suitable stone that we could use for flaking. And to do that, we went to a section um, it was separate from the actual quarrying section. Um, it was a waterfall and a creek bed. And Epi told us that the falls that we were visiting were modified during World War II by American soldiers for the purpose of providing drinking water. So that's the dam you can see there behind Zach and um, Mark is taking a photo of it there. Uh, we had several hours there beside the creek breaking up incredibly hard basalt and all had a go of napping. So Mark took us all through the basics of napping really large um, blanks and we all had a go there. I can't stress enough how tough this stuff was. You can see the flaking bed there. And of course, Mark produced some incredible work that we were all really amazed at. Um, so I've mentioned Epi a few times, but I'll just say a little bit more about her. Epi is the first female Samoan archaeologist. She studied a Bachelor of Arts at the University of Hawaii as an anthropology archaeology major, and she studied a master's at the University of Oregon in the field of anthropology. She recorded over 800 ads grinding basins known as Fawaga, and she has had an extensive career as an archaeologist in Samoa. So you can see her pictured here with the Fawaga. Um, they're the, you can see the little basins that have, are full of water. So altogether, it was a well-rounded experience as we had been looking at ads for months and actually seeing the quarry site, ads blanks, doing napping for ourselves. And then the Fawaga basins really connected the reality of making such tools and being able to visualize spatially the movements of ads makers between these phases of manufacture. So uh, thank you for listening to this, my very brief talk on what was a very fantastic experience. Thank you to Stephen, Percival, and Epi, and her husband, Lalawasi, and of course, Mark, for um, taking me along. Thank you. I will now pass to... Mary, Marianne? Yep, yeah, okay. I just share my screen. Okay, can you all see that screen? Yep. Yeah. Awesome. 
Okay, my name's uh, Marianne Stone and I'm currently completing my honours uh, year at UNE, specifically focusing on uh, the potential presence of earth ovens in southeastern Arabia. Um, I just have a trigger warning that there is images of deceased animals at the end of this slide, um, so I hope that doesn't offend anyone. Um, so my jobs in Samoa was uh, firstly to uh, create 3D models of all the artefacts and upload them onto pedestal. So the ads is that Mark was talking about, I would uh, photograph them and upload them up uh, online. I did half did ads, is, even did a cocoa plant and a coconut, which I've never done before, but that was always interesting to try. Um, and we also went out um, into the jungle as pictured here um, and had to model things on the go sort of things. So we had a lot of fun taking around 200, 300 pictures of these grinding stones. Um, I was also sort of the unofficial photographer, so I was taking a lot of photos when we were at workshops um, or out visiting uh, people and learning different things. So I took a lot of photos of what we were doing. Um, personally, I was very interested to uh, learn about Samoan culture. I'd never travelled to um, any islands in the Pacific before, uh, so this was a new experience for me and I absolutely enjoyed uh, experiencing the environment, the people, um, and the food as well. Um, I also love to gain insight into earth oven cooking itself. Um, I'd only been reading about it uh, through literature um, and had never actually seen one in real life. So to have the opportunity to help make one and witness the process was really amazing and has helped me a lot um, in my research itself. Uh, and also I'd love to befriend the local animals, uh, which sadly Georgina reminded me that not all the animals were friendly. Uh, but the ones at the centre were very friendly, luckily, so I was very happy to make friends with them. Uh, I want to start off with basically what earth ovens are. So this diagram here shows you just a typical sort of diagram of what they look like. Uh, they're typically dug into the ground. It's like a pit-like structure. Uh, and then the, they you start layering hot coal layers, which is usually burnt down wood, um, to sort of create your heat source. So you get a hot coal um, source of heat. On top of that, you then add a pit lining, which is typically stones to sort of keep the oven hot over a longer period of time and help conduct the heat. Um, then you usually have your food placed on top of that, wrapped in any sort of botanical material to prevent burning, as well as to prevent any soil from getting into the food, um, which is usually from the earthen um, lid that's placed over the top. Um, so yeah, this is what Earth Oven is, and they're very significant in providing information on um, ancient people's culture, as well as what foods they're eating and their dietary practices as well. So the Samoan Earth Ovens, also known as Umu, so I'll probably change between each term um, as this presentation goes along, um, but I was surprised to find that they were made above ground, which I had not seen before in any literature that I'd come across. Um, so as you can see here, uh, they've put a metal plate down as sort of your pit lining, so that helped conduct the heat. And then the fire was built on top instead of in the ground. So I've, that was very interesting for me to see um, and has uh, definitely given me some something to think about um, in my own research. Um, instead of earthen lids, so soil put on top, they would put leaves on top to keep the heat in, uh, which I was interested to see if that would work. And it did very much. It got very hot in that little fallow where they had the earth oven. Um, and then lastly, just to see the amount of food they would cook in these ovens and um, how they would use uh, all the products sort of left over from the food they were making, um, such as the green banana peels uh, to sort of create a layer against the hot stones as well. So it's just very fascinating to see the whole process um, live and uh, also sort of take part in it as well. So the first step, um, in creating an umu or an earth oven is to create your hot coal base. So you would get your fuel source, which in this case was coconut husks and um, wood, and you would start that fire off uh, to get your sort of heat conducting. Um, they used these large stone, uh, not stone blocks, wood blocks around um, the coconut husk to keep it sort of contained in, in the one area, um, just so that the hot coals didn't spread everywhere and they kept in the one spot. Um, and then as the uh, fire got hotter and you would add your wood, then they would place their um, hot stones on top to start them heating up uh, while the food would be prepared. 
Uh, as the coals were burning down, uh, you would start preparing your food. Uh, you had a multiple, like multiple range. You had balsami, which is pictured on the right. You had baked green bananas. Um, you had taro and in some cases pork, which we experienced on our last night in Samoa. I was very fascinated with uh, polsami uh, and how you actually made it. Avamoa here in the pictures made it look so easy. Uh, me trying to make this was very messy and uh, my wrapped polsami did not look as good as his, uh, but he didn't say anything, so I didn't say anything. So I'm happy with how that went and it tasted good all the same. Um, but yeah, the process was very interesting and the, the taro leaves were very delicious actually once they were cooked as well. So once you've prepared all your food, you would start layering your uh, umu. Um, so as you can see here in the pictures, they've spread the hot coals over the metal plate. They've removed the large uh, wooden blocks and they've started placing on their foods. Um, first, they put on taro, which is a root vegetable, sort of like a potato. Um, but not, it took, I gather it'd take a bit longer to cook. That's why it was put on the base and needed higher temperatures um, as well in order for it to be ready at the same time as the other foods. Um, and so while the taro was put down, then they placed the hot stones on top and then the foods that required less proximity to the heat were then put over the top of that. So as you can see here, uh, you've got your hot stone layer and then the polsami that has been wrapped has been put on top. Um, you see the green banana rinds put here as well as a layer against the balsami and the hot stones so that they weren't getting burnt or um, creating any like unnecessary mess as well. Um, and then here you can see the big green leaves that they've put over the top. Um, and as you can see through each image, it's progressed to the point where there's no steam coming out. So that uh, the oven is fully sort of um, encapsulated um, and the food is cooking at the highest temperature that it needs to be. So now it's left to cook. So the cooking duration, I was surprised, only took uh, 40 minutes to an hour. And this depended on the amount of food that was being ma like made and what also was being made as well. Um, at the time when we were cooking the pig, it still only took an hour um, and this, I think was helped along by using hot stones that were put inside the pig as well as around it. So it was cooking from the inside out basically. Um, so once uh, uh, you made the earth oven, it was left to cook for this amount of time. So you'd have food fairly quick, quickly, basically. It's basically like cooking something in an oven at home um, that you do today. So lastly, we got to eat and it was, I was a bit skeptical. I'm not the most adventurous eater, but um, the food was absolutely amazing. Um, and you can see here on the left is the polsami and anything that was left over was put in a, a coconut shell as well. So that was cooked on the oven as well. Uh, you've got the taro there and the pork was absolutely amazing um, and tasted very delicious. So yeah, this is my experience with uh, working with Simone Earth Ovens. Um, and I'd love to thank Stephen for making this opportunity available and Mark for taking us along. So thank you. So I think up next is Zach. I will pass it along to you. Hello, can you hear me? Yep. Hey, just sort up my screen. Okay. Hey all, um, I'm Zachariah Strickland. Um, I'm an undergrad student from UNE, currently doing my BA, uh, majoring in archaeology. Um, I was one of the three students uh, from UNE that were lucky enough to make the trip to Samoa. Um, now, firstly, my experience in Samoa was just amazing. Uh, a beautiful island, so much to see. Uh, the people were friendly and accommodating, uh, great to work with, and we were also just surrounded by people who were just interested in um, Pacific uh, stone tool technology. Um, but I also had a great team to go with um, from UNE as well, Marianne, Georgina, Mark. I was the puppy of the group, <laughs> literally, but it was cool to have these guys to, to bounce off. Um, now, um, what I want to talk about is this uh, wonderful material that I found super interesting, uh, Coconut Senate, known as Afa and Samoa, uh, made from the fibre of coconut husk. 
Um, now, the Pacific uh, considers this coconut tree as the tree of life, as everything from this tree can be used, such as creating furniture, uh, clothing, tools, and providing food. Um, it's a great resource for the Pacific, um, and it's available everywhere on the island, like literally everywhere. Um, so to give you a bit of context, um, Senate is a type of rope or cord, uh, which was used to bind or, or lash objects together, um, but also used in um, cultural ceremonies and, and meetings. Um, now, this stuff is extremely tough, um, durable and resilient to seawater, which makes it perfect um, in the Pacific. Uh, where are we? Um, so as mentioned, it's tough. Um, it would hold these large huts together. In Samoa, they call this structure um, a fale. Um, but you can see here, this has about 20 wooden pillars, um, each pillar measuring about 20 to 30 centimeters um, um, round, or the circumference um, measurement, and approximately two meters high. Um, it also held the wooden logs together um, that was used to strengthen the roof. Um, there's Marianne in the back there, um, our human scale. Uh, slide three. Uh, it was also used in the maritime world uh, in the Pacific. Um, it was used to connect these traditional canoes and the outriggers together and to also support the wind sails. Uh, but it was also used it was also uh, utilized in stone tool technology uh, where they would lash stone adds uh, onto wooden handles um, using a tying technique that I'm still trying to figure out. Um, but this tying technique doesn't require a knot. Um, it's just, yeah, it's something I, I don't quite understand yet. But it's a very popular um, tool um, and it was pretty essential uh, in the Pacific. Uh, now, there's a range of different coconuts in Samoa, and a specific one they like to use uh, for this material, which is called, um, this coconut is called the, well, it's coconut senate, or senate coconut. Um, now, this coconut grows long, uh, which is perfect for crafting um, senate. Uh, Marianne, um, as she said, she um, did a 3D model of this <laughs> Um, this coconut and it was quite difficult for her because it was so big and it was unbalanced and it had to stay still and it kept rolling everywhere but uh, she managed to get there at the end um, and yeah this is the one she 3D modeled so you can see here yeah, this is over half a meter long it's huge um, but yeah as I said it was perfectly sized um, to make senate um, and I'll show you why Now, step one, obviously, climbing um, the right tree and selecting a good size senate, um, sorry, coconut. Now, the locals prefer to use um, immature coconuts as the maturity stage of the fruit did matter. Now, they figured out um, that the husk from an immature coconut was soft and easier to process, where the fully matured um, fruit was a lot harder. Um, I'll explain um, more in a bit. Uh, step two was husking the coconut. Um, person husking here, his name is Avamua. Um, he's the man and legend to me. Um, I won't go into it, but um, yeah, this guy is just so knowledgeable in his traditional arts. Um, but yeah. Uh, so you've probably seen this technique um, where they use a thick branch um, that has been planted into the soil and using it to stab the fruit on one end and applying pressure on the opposite side to remove the husk. Now, for the sake of making senate, I think it, uh, this part is important as you want to make sure you get a good sized chunk um, when husking. You can see here, hopefully you can see my pin, pen point here. Um, these are great sizes because later on you're going to have to process these. You don't want it any thinner than this. Uh, step three. Uh, step three was pretty simple. Sorry, I didn't have a picture. I couldn't find one for this, but it's basically just peeling um, the skin from the fiber um, just to remove it from the, um, sorry, the fiber from the pith. It just makes it easier to, to process. 
uh, step four. All right. Th so this is probably the most um, labor intensive part of um, making Senate. Uh, this is where you pound a husk um, on a thick log uh, with with a wooden block to, sorry, on a wooden block um, to separate the pith and the fiber. Now, as mentioned in step one about the material of the fruit, um, this is when it matters. Uh, if the fruit was fully mature, then it becomes harder um, and so it, it's just harder to to process it because the the fiber is just so thick and hard. Uh, so what they used to do, oh, this is the um, the end product. Oh, this is after pounding it. But what they used to do to soften the the husk. Um, so they used to take this to the sea um, and let it actually sit in there for about three to four weeks, um, which will soften the the husk and then later beaten. Um, also, as mentioned in step two about husking, um, a decent sized chunk, you want to make sure you get um, a good size to work with or your labor, hard labor will end up with um, little reward. That's another picture as well. Let me see. Uh, step five. Okay, so step five, uh, once the uh, pith and fiber have been separated um, from the pounding, uh, you leave the fiber out to dry in the sun for a few hours. Uh, and step six was prepping for braiding, uh, where you will take out individual strands uh, from the fiber and roll it to a decent size um, where it can be braided later on. I won't go into the technique or rather can't go into it as I didn't have the time to master the craft. So, um, but it was pretty cool watching other more um, braid and use the material material to lash um, on stone adds onto wooden handles. Um, now the Afa holds a lot of cultural and traditional history. Uh, there's a lot of value in it. Um, unfortunately, this craft isn't as practiced as it used to be. Um, but Stephen Percival, um, who's also in this um, chat, um, has made it his goal to revive this technology um, and keep this knowledge alive and well. So. Um, as a Pacific Islander member myself, like I do appreciate that from Steve. Um, but yeah, that's pretty much me. I just want to say thank you to everyone who was involved in this project. It was an um, amazing experience, especially for my um, first time out on the field. So yeah, thank you. Thanks, Zach. Mark, I will hand back to you. Okay, now that sounds good. Okay, can everybody see that? All right, so thanks for those uh, talks. Um, every one of those had some element in it that relates back to uh, stone or ads, even Mary Ann's, because uh, one of the interesting things that I discovered doing this literature review is that in the Pacific, um, between islands, they would actually trade those stones that were used uh, for the cooking. Uh, archaeologists have been sourcing studies, doing sourcing studies on these basalt uh, stones that were used in earth ovens and found that they didn't necessarily originate from the island that they were found on. So I find that fascinating um, to think that, uh, you know, what's going on there? Was it was it a practical thing where certain basalt stones are just better than others? Or were there some sort of cultural thing going on where I'll give you some of your stones? That was so hard. So one second. Um, yeah. Okay, so what I'm gonna do now is just do some summing up. I'm gonna um, uh, talk for a fair while now. So uh, I'm not offended if you have to leave and go do other things, but I'll be talking for about another 15, 15 20 minutes on, on what we learned. So I know we're, we're running a bit behind. So uh, apologies for that, but uh, you know what my lectures are like if you've done any of my units before. Okay, so stone quarrying and flaking. Let's loop it back to that slide that I had uh, in the introduction part of the thing. Okay, so this was our goal, to make some Samoan stone adzes uh, using traditional methods, a stone procurement, adds flaking, adds grinding, 
handle manufacture, and ABS hafting. So I'm going to talk about each of these now and what we learned. Okay. So ABS flaking in Samoa. This is um, a chart that I developed by when I did my uh, um, literature review. Um, just deconstructing what I learned from archaeological studies um, across uh, different sites on Samoa. And this was the reduction sequence that I came up with, the recipe, as it were, for how stone adzes were made based on that literature review. Okay. Um, what I'll be looking at in the, the rest of this final little uh, summation is we'll look at the stone quarrying aspects. I'll talk a little bit about the stone types, the basalt, in a little bit more detail. Um, I'll go into some detail on what we learned um, of actually making those ads blanks. Um, lots of challenges. Um, I'll go over some of that because it's kind of insightful. And then perhaps the greatest puzzle of all is uh, grinding the edges on these things. But I'll get to that in a, in a minute. And then I'll finish off with uh, some insights into ads hafting and uh, the role of uh, uh, Samoan stone ads is in the modern day. Stone procurement, um, Georgina, she uh, told us about um, our visit to, to Tonga Matau. Uh, down there in the lower right was the, the creek where we uh, procured stone um, there for, with permission from the Leone village. Um, and then we also looked at Moa Moa Creek um, on Upolo in uh, uh, Samoa proper. We stuck to the creek beds um, because we were doing uh, stone flaking. These creeks have tremendous flows of water through the year, so there'd be no worries about mixing up what, um, confusing what we were making with the archaeological record. So we stuck to the creek bottoms in these active, environmentally active zones. And also that was a practical thing because that's where we could find the rock, the rest of the landscape being covered in jungle. Um, but uh, you can see down in the lower left, that was... Uh, um, about an hour's worth, probably less than that actually, of making um, flake blanks uh, at the Moa Moa Creek source. And uh, Georgina was the one who struck the largest flake off, I think of anyone during the whole workshop. Um, so I actually got in a discussion with Epi about that. Epi was saying that women couldn't have do, done this because they weren't strong enough, um, but Clearly, it's not all a strength thing. There's a lot of it has to do with angles and just knowing what you're doing. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the Samoan basalt. Let's deconstruct this a bit. What we've got here, I don't know how well you can read that, but this is a chart that the flint knapper Eric Callahan put together, and it ranks um, different stone types based on its ease of workability. Um, we're at 0.5 up at the top. It's super easy. Um, cold asphalts and candies, hard candies. You can nap those, believe it or not. And then clear down at the bottom, the, the toughest stone is 5.5, okay? So just to give you an idea, obsidian is about a one. That's just pure natural native uh, uh, volcanic glass. Super easy to, to uh, knock flakes off of. Flint is about there at three. You know, the English flint that most people are familiar with. Cherts, you see a lot of chert in Australia. Um, it's not as good as flint, but it's still pretty good. It's in that around 3.5. Silcrete, this is my idea about where silcrete would fall in this. Callahan never napped any silcrete, but I've napped a lot. And it naps sort of like the, the, the tougher uh, materials, um, tougher chalcedonies and agates and silcrete's kind of in there. Um, that's the, the classic stone from Australia. And then we have basalt at 5.0 almost off the bottom of the scale. That's how tough basalt can be. But some basalts can be up there um, at a 2.0 in terms of nappability, not, not that far off obsidian. So I'm reading through the literature of Tatonga Matau and they're talking about how outstanding the stone is for napping and all that. And I'm thinking, oh, it's gonna be somewhere in that two to three area. No, the Tatonga Matau stone and the Moa Moa stone is definitely down at the five, okay? It's probably five, maybe the Moa Moa stuff's a bit tougher than the Taga Matau, probably 5.2, 5.3. This is a very, very tough stone to nap, okay? So that's something very interesting to think about. 
Um, we did find that there were differences between the Tatanga Matau and the Moa Moa's um, sources. Moa Moa is on Upolo in, in Samoa. Um, Tatanga Matau is in American Samoa on Tutuila, a different island altogether. And it's uh, Tatanga Matau, as we learned from Georgina, was that massive quarry. That stuff was traded um, right through to Tonga in particular, but a lot of islands right through the, uh, that part of Pacific. Um, archaeologists have traced stone from Tatanga Matau to those islands. So it was highly prized, not just in Samoa, but also other parts of the Pacific. Uh, we found just, this is what we discovered during our workshop, comparing it to uh, the Moa Moa source um, on Upolo, um, it's not, it's it's kind of a, of a piece, all right? It's very tough stone, but the uh, Tatanga Matau stuff had fewer crystals, all right? It's just less sparkly when you turned it in the light. Um, we had a, a Maori uh, stone craftsman uh, with us, uh, Warren Warbrick, at the workshop. And he pointed out that if you rubbed it with your fingernail, that it would take more of your fingernail off the, the Moa Moa stuff than the Tatanga Matau stuff would, just because of that the extra bit of, of crystals. Um, so there was definitely a difference but it's important to note that on Samoa, um, there is stone sources that uh, is suitable for making ads as we did it during the workshop. Another thing is uh, one of our workshop participants from the United States, he called, uh, there's this texture thing that you get in the Samoan basalt that he characterizes waves. And it has to do with the way the crystals have grown and sort of interacted with, with uh, each other. And it created this interesting undulating uh, topology to the flake scars that made it much tougher to nap, okay? So both basalts from both sources are good for making adzes, um, but it has raised some interesting questions about, you know, it, the Tatangamas Tau stuff was definitely better, is a little bit easier to flake, still very tough, um, but it'd be really interesting to find more basalt uh, sources on Upolu and uh, characterize those, those sources and do engineering tests. Um, basalts lend themselves very well to different types of strength tests. And you can characterize one basalt to another um, based on, on the different mechanical characteristics of how it breaks. As it happens, basalt is really good for road-based material. So there's heaps of literature out there on different types of basalts and how to analyze them. So these are things you know, as archaeologists being engaged in things like this, part of it is you're generating research questions. You're generating ideas that you can then test uh, using our scientific methods. All right. So I'll keep coming back to that through this talk. So what on a, what's another insight we had? And this, there were to quarrying and the ads making. One of the really super challenging aspects we had in the workshop was hammer stones. Okay. Um, we were thinking that, oh, we, we, you know, or I was, that we could just use some of the other rocks that were in these creek beds and use those as hammer stones to break up the basalt. And it kind of worked, but they were, they were kind of soft. The surfaces were weathered. Um, and when we just picked up the local rocks right next to us and used them, they worked okay, but they weren't that great. And this stone is so tough to fracture. You have to put so much force into it that if the stone was a little bit soft, you weren't generating enough force to cause the, the crack to propagate through the stone. So our fallback position in that context was to use solid copper bar and also a steel sledgehammer. That's what it took to, to knock off some of those, those flake blanks. Now you'll see that image in the, the middle there at the bottom. That's from uh, Papua New Guinea. This is something we did not try for safety reasons. And this is what I call a block on block technique where you take a boulder that's the size of the core that you're trying to nap or even bigger, and you just slam it down forcefully onto the platform. You still have to follow all the rules of stone flaking and the way that you have to position yourself in order to hit that platform using this technique is right in front of the core. Now, as you can imagine, chunks of stone are gonna be coming off the core, but even more dangerous is you don't, if you have to let go that hammer stone when it hits, you don't know where it's going to bounce. I almost broke my leg one time doing this, this uh, method on Flores in Indonesia, which would have been very bad because it was a very remote location. And it made me realize the danger involved in quarrying at these places. And this would have been true uh, in the old days too, in the, in the, uh, up there on Tatanga Matau. It would have been a very dangerous practice. 
Uh, using the sledgehammer, not only is a steel head um, really good for breaking the rock because it's so resistant, but also, as you can see, Bruce is demonstrating here, you can stand off to the side so that when you knock the flake off, um, it's going out in a direction that's not, hopefully not towards your legs. Um, and uh, uh, despite that picture, we did wear safety gear um, as much as possible. So uh, I probably shouldn't have put that photo in this particular lecture because uh, Bruce wasn't putting on the safety gear on this particular day. Um, I felt for the guy though, because uh, we brought gloves over and he tried to put them on his hands on, on the first day. And he must have struggled for 20 minutes trying to get the glove onto his massive hands. He was a, he's a big bloke. Um, but in any case, nobody was injured in any of our stoneworking uh, experiments. Oh, and just go to go back. So good hammer stones, just to, to draw that uh, full circle. Um, good hammer stones must have been a key resource for the people who were making houses. Um, think about that image that Georgina had on that slide of, of that, that ads quarry in Hawaii, um, where you could see all the lithics on the ground because it's not covered in jungle. That level of density was probably at Tatagama Matau. Um, we're talking hundreds of thousands of ads as were being made there. They must have had a source of hammer stones that were good for that, and they must have prized those hammer stones. And that's just at that one quarry. And it probably was true right across Samoa. All right, now I'm going to nerd out a little bit. Um, it wouldn't be one of my lectures if I didn't nerd out a little bit. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the technicalities of ads flaking, and I'm going to try to do it in a way that was a little bit user friendly for you guys who don't, who haven't done any stone working before. So we've learned from that that uh, prior talk that a lot of innovation was happening in Samoa to create these uh, ads as with trapezoidal cross sections, um, and the way they would do that is really kind of a, a, a retouching technique where they take the slab of stone, usually a flake plank, it could be a flat cobble, and they just knock off flakes, mainly from the one surface to create those sloped sides, okay? So that's the way that they would, in a simplified version, that's the way that they would create these trapezoidal cross sections. In this image, um, there on the right, you can see the cross section of the ads. That's what I've duplicated in my schematic drawing here. You're looking end on onto that slab of stone. And each of those arrows is knocking off a flake. Is everybody with me there? So you can see the series of flakes that was knocked off each side of that flake blank to create, uh, to, to target that cross section in the middle, which is the, the trapezoidal cross section in the red dotted line. So this is the, ideally the way it would work. You just start and you start retouching around those edges and you bring those edges in until you converge on that perfect, that perfect trapezoidal shape. Note that you're not thinning it, okay? So blank selection is crucial. Those flakes are not traveling in a way that they're making that blank thinner, okay? They're, it's a shaping technique, not a thinning technique. And that's very important because what that means is getting that blank that's already close to the thickness that you want is pretty crucial. Um, so that tells me that there must be something going on with the way that they were reducing these cores to get that blank of the, the, the size and shape that they wanted, especially, you know, we're talking industrial production of these ads. Okay. This isn't just one or two people making enough ads to do a job. They're making them to trade to other islands. They're probably make them, making them in their thousands, if not tens of thousands. So blank selection would have been key. Dive into the archeological literature. There's almost nothing out there. Even though archeologists have excavated at Tatanga Matau, there's nothing really in that you can sink your teeth into about how they were reducing the cores to make these blanks. When we were walking through the jungle to the quarry, we found lots of flakes. I didn't see a single core. Very interesting. So again, you know, research design, you know, this is this is the sort of stuff that we've done this now. We've established something interesting. Let's go back to the actual archaeological site and try to unpack that a little bit more. All right. Now I'm going to go into some of the problems that all of us encountered, uh, students and myself alike, in making these ads. Is. Um, and I'm going to start with this one, the danger of step terminations. If you notice those blue arrows, each arrow, as you're reducing the width of your blank, 
trying to get that trapezoidal cross section, you have to keep going steeper and steeper in the way that you're striking off those flakes. You can strike more obliquely against the stone um, on those first sets of flakes, but as you get further and further in, you have to keep going at a, a more of a right angle to the, the stone. And that's because the flakes are wider at the platform end, the end that you strike than they are at the end where it tapers off at the other opposite end of the flake. Um, that schematic I've done, I've just decreased it by about 10%, 13% of each of those flakes. And you can see how the edges of the ads get steeper and steeper and steeper the closer you get to that trapezoidal section. Now, if you're not careful, what happens is you're hitting the stone so hard to get these flakes to come off that if you don't, if you strike too close to the edge on those really super steep platforms, the flake's going to go part way down, and then your follow through the hammer stone is just going to snap the flake off before it has a chance to travel all the way to the bottom of the core to the come out the opposite side there. That's called a step termination, and that's very, very bad because once a step termination starts, you can take off more flakes, um, and but unless you change your technique, you're going to keep getting more step terminations. Every single one of us um, at the workshop had lots of step terminations. You see them a lot on the archaeological ones as well. But there's, you know, there's, there's very, there's some step terminations aren't that big a deal because they don't go that deep. Others are so deep they ruin the the whole blank. We had a lot that were ruined. Um, archaeologically, you don't see that many that are ruined because they knew what they were doing. Another thing I want to talk about is see how thick I made the blank thicker on this. So you actually, this is not a thinning technique. So how do you get the thickness of the blank to match your schematic in your head about how thick a proper ad should be? I'll get to that in a minute. Okay, so how do you deal with step terminations? One way is what's called hammer dressing, okay? You can take your hammer stone and just pound straight onto that step termination and pulverize it. That's a good way of getting rid of step terminations. Okay, you can see my schematic there. Bam, 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 bam. You just keep tapping it, tapping it. It's called hammer dressing. Remember from the Cook Islands, that was a technique they innovated there because hammer dressing wasn't done on Samoa, um, at least not in the ads production. It was a technique that was known. They used them to make um, canoe anchors and such, but they didn't use it in ads production, which is very interesting, I think. Um, one thing that... Um, Lots of the workshop participants innovated. Um, I'd say just about everyone did this at one stage or another, with the possible exception of Georgina. Um, and that's using that hammer dressing technique to, to get rid of a stuff up on the, on the face of the ads. So it's an intuitive solution to a problem, but for some reason they didn't do it in Samoa. And the reason they didn't do it in Samoa is they didn't have to because they had ways of avoiding uh, these mistakes. Here's another possible solution to those step fractures. This is a technique that um, Aboriginal people in Australia would use to resharpen their horse hoof cores. The horse hoof cores would get step flaking around the edges. You just strike further back in. Okay. Instead of close to the edge, you hit a long way from the edge. The flake, the green outline there is the flake and it propagates through and it takes the step fracture off and it's preserved on the back side of the flake and it cleans off your face of your ads. But in the schematic that I've got here, in order to do that, you're stuffing up your trapezoidal cross section. You've made it too narrow. Um, now, so it wouldn't work, especially in this basalt, again, very tough. It wouldn't work really to salvage something um, once you get it to this stage. I'm leaving open the possibility that very careful manipulation of platform depths. You might be able to kind of converge so that your very last really deep platform flakes are taken off exactly when it gets to that, that width that you want for the ads. That would take a, uh, a lot of skill and a lot of practice, which we didn't have, a, uh, we didn't have the skills or the time to really develop the skills necessary to be that strategic, but it is a possibility. Here's another possible solution, and that's to prepare a platform by flipping the ads over, taking flakes off towards the opposite face. That's the green flakes that I've knocked off there. 
and then flipping it back over again and knocking off where I've got those blue flakes struck. Okay, it's a bifacial technique. And by doing that, by lowering the platform edge, you can strike off flakes that would undercut those step terminations. All right, so that's a viable uh, possibility, but it results in a lenticular cross section. We know that that was not the strated, the, the, we know that 90% of them were trapezoidal, okay? So it wasn't a desired cross-section type. So it doesn't seem to have been something that Samoan stone workers did. Also, I would point out um, that it's be very difficult to do this with the hammer stones that we had. Um, maybe there is a source of hammer stones that you could do this sort of delicate work with. Um, but again, you have to hit this stone awful hard. So you'd have to have hammer stones that are exactly the right shape and consistency to do this. So that brings back the uh, hammer stone issue again. So possible that this was a, in, in, in the toolbox of, uh, of techniques that was used, but um, I didn't see a lot of evidence for it. And I think it's unlikely that it was used very often, but now we're getting into this, the uh, areas where there was clear evidence for these sort of techniques. One is the trifacial reduction. You've got your step terminations. If you turn the ads over and you strike flakes off from platforms on the opposite face of the ads, you can see there I've got a flake knocked off from the green, a blow to the top of the ads at the green arrow, and it propagates partway down the side. And then that sets up a negative uh, flake scar that you can then strike the opposite direction, take a flake off the opposite side. You've cleaned off your uh, step terminations. And then you still have your, op your other platform, the original platform, where you can do flaking as well and get that cross section. But it'll be triangular. You'll have those two platforms, the, the ones um, at the top of the drawing. But then you'll have that new platform on the apex of the ads. This was a definite practice in Samoa. And I think it was a, a method for thinning, making that that uh, blank thinner so it matches um, what they were aiming for at the start. So if you're doing a trapezoidal ads, it gets to the point where, uh-oh, it's going to be too thick. You um, get a platform on this top edge, and then you try strike flakes back this way. It lowers that thickness down, and it also eliminates any step fractures that may have occurred along the sides of the ads. The blank that's in the 3D model there on the right-hand side is a masterpiece of stone working where the uh, stone flaker did exactly that. He set up that triangular cross-section at the back end of the ads, and there's hardly a, a step termination on there anywhere. And this is a big ads too. It's it's pushing two feet long. It's it's absolutely enormous. Uh, so this he was hitting that stone extremely hard to get those flakes to come off but he did it, um, I'm saying he, I don't know for sure if it was a man or a woman, but they did it um, in a way that was uh, just an absolute masterpiece of stone working. And then finally, I'll put you out of your misery. Um, this is the other option. Uh, also clear evidence of this strategy where they would um, set up platforms at each of the, instead of in the middle of the top of the ads, they would do it down, down the side and across the top, down the opposite side and across the top. And that would create those four platform edges. Okay, and so this was a way of also eliminating step fractures on the, on the sides of the ads, um, but also you could take off series of flakes and get that closer and closer to that desired profile. Okay, so now we've got our, our different flaking solutions to various problems that we encounter during the workshop. So what are the implications of that for archaeology? Well, what we've got now is we've got a technological basis where we can reevaluate that Samoan ads typology. Remember that? The, the what was it, 10 ads types and a bunch of subtypes and you know, all these things in between. And what we've got now is a technological um explanation for why some of those ads types uh might exist. And then we can start unpacking that typology and looking at it from an entirely different direction, not just shapes, the way things were shaped and uh, the differences in shapes, but actually looking at the reasons why those shapes are the way they are. Um, so again, research design. And I didn't get into this, but those flakes that I kept talking about and all those different techniques, those flakes will look different. 
okay? You'll be able to look at some of those flakes and say it was struck off using this strategy. So even though you don't have the blanks, you know, they were successfully napped and taken away off the quarry. You have the, the flakes that were left behind. We can unpack those now using some of the insights from our workshop and figure out exactly what some of these strategies are um, and also kind of fine tuning that, testing some of these ideas I have. This is again, research design, and uh, this is how you start a, a research project. I might note that there has been excavations done at uh, Tatanga Matau. Um, not that many excavations, but the density of the debris is such that the archeologist who did the excavations came away with, from memory, 250 kilos of debitage from the excavation they did. 250 kilos, okay? Um, countless tens of thousands of flakes. Um, and they only analyzed them by size and whether they had cortex in them, okay? So it wasn't that useful for this approach to looking at stone flaking. But theoretically, I have a feeling all that stuff's back in, in America because that's where the archeologist was based. But theoretically, if Leone Village could get that stuff repatriated back to them, we could go in, wouldn't even have to do more excavations. We could just analyze what's already been excavated and start unteasing some of this. So let's look at the bigger picture, the bigger narrative. Now we've got this, this technological uh, description of, of ads making some of the technical difficulties, the difficulties of the stone, the varying nature of the stones. We've got a basis for considering what, what those, why the people were enduring the long pause. What is an adaptation to the Samoan, tough Samoan best salts? Um, also the, the subsequent innovations on the other islands. Hammer dressing, you know, the, they didn't do it in Samoa, but they did it in the Cook Islands. Um, so what what's going on there? Um, so we've got a basis then for extending into that that larger narrative about ads as in across the Pacific. And of course, you know, we try this ourselves. Um, I've thrown out some ideas of different ways of of uh, issues in in making the ads blanks. Um, but the next step would you've got a structure now a strategy for actually extending those experiments and really drilling down deep. Um, all in all, we maybe only did three or four hours of stone flaking during the workshop over uh, the course of the two weeks, um, interspersed with all the other stuff that we were doing. Um, so if you sat down and for you know a couple months and just made ads, as, I think you would come up with a lot of interesting insights. Ads grinding. This is I flagged this early on as one of the mysteries that came out of the workshop, and the reason for that is we found it extremely difficult using traditional techniques to grind the cutting edges onto these ads. Um, if you're unfamiliar with stone tools, I've been talking about flaking. That was the way of preparing the ads blank, but the way it was finished, the way the cutting edge for doing the woodworking was produced, they would grind it down. They'd grind off all the flake scars and create a really keen cutting edge on there. Um, and I was thinking before we left, oh, that won't be, a, you know, there's plenty of basalt. We can just grind it on the basalt, add sand on if we need to for abrasive. But what we found is that grinding basalt adds blanks on basalt grinding stones just doesn't work very well. What tends to happen is the grinding stone polishes. It's not abrasive enough. Um, you can do it. You, but it takes forever. Um, we tried sand. We tried adding the sand that we picked up from the beach onto these uh, uh, basalt grinding stones. And I thought, oh, this will do it. You know, this this will fix it because I do it all the time here in Australia, grinding basalt on sandstone. You add a bit of sand, it just makes it go that much quicker. We added sand to these rocks. Thought it was working really well at first because it, you can see Bruce, he's got uh, that gray paste. Looks like it's really wearing down the ads, but what you're doing is basically grinding the sand into silt. Um, it's not making that much difference on the ads blank itself. Um, so because the Samoan sand is, it's also basalt. It's not quartz sand, it's basalt. Of course it is. The whole island is basalt. All right. So we tried pecking on those stones. I was thinking that it might be one of the ways that you would get the the developed depression in the grinding stones was by pecking because in Australia, that was a way of resharpening um, uh, uh, 
grinding stones that were used to process grains is they would peck it, it makes the surface rougher, um, but it didn't work here. It made the surface rougher, but again, basalt on basalt, it didn't. It only made a marginal improvement in how quickly the the uh, ads grinding occurred. So I I ground one ads to the point where I was relatively satisfied with it, and it took about five hours, and it wasn't even that big in ads. Okay, um, I think it's about four, four or five hours, somewhere in between there. Um, it didn't make any indentation at all. You wouldn't even you wash rinse the the grinding stone off. You wouldn't even been tell been able to tell I did much on it at all. Um, now look at these grinding stones um, at the bottom there, the foaga. Um, each of those depressions in there is uh, what's traditionally interpreted as a grinding basin for grinding stone adzes. That huge uh, foaga is in Maumau Creek, okay? Um, it's actually in the bed of the creek, and that was the first clue that there might be Napa stone for making ads is in that creek, which turned out to be correct. Uh, Stephen clued us in on that. Um, and you can see that each of those basins, they're kind of roundish. They're not, they don't match what I'm used to seeing elsewhere in the world for axe grinding grooves. A lot of you will have seen those in Australia. They tend to be long, linear things for grind the way the Aboriginal people ground axes. Same way, um, in uh, Europe as well, they tend to be long, linear things. Here in uh, Samoa, and I've seen uh, ones that look similar from Hawaii, um, the, these big, wide, round basins, they're beautiful things. Um, that it's, it's almost like soap bubbles, the way that soap bubbles kind of arrange themselves on a surface. It's kind of what it reminds me of. Um, and it's a mystery, because think how deep those are. We didn't you know, we we weren't getting anywhere in, in, in our grinding stones, but these are deep, okay? Um, you can look at the 3D model that Marianne made of the one on the right, it's huge. Um, and that, I didn't look at it before I started uh, preparing this lecture, but I think it's about probably five or six centimeters deep, that depression in there. Um, so it's a mystery. They're doing something to create these depressions in grinding adzes. Um, it's probably not food. Food would be a lot softer than stone. Um, so they probably are ads grinding basins. Um, I think that interpretation is is 100% correct. But you know how much time is is involved in creating those depressions? Is there a different way of creating them? Did they have some source of of abrasive grit? Um, uh, Warren told us that in New, Ze New Zealand um, they would grind up certain stones stones to make abrasive grits. Maybe grits were coming from other islands. It's hard to know, but Keep in mind, this is a, a industrial production of these adzes. Lots of grinding going on. Uh, Epi recorded 800 of these foaga uh, at the coastline uh, near Tatonga Matau, um, where Georgina had some pictures there, 800 of them, okay? And they're dotted all through uh, Samoa, these individual um, uh, foaga. So fascinating thing going on here, and I have no explanation for why we weren't able to get better results grinding our ads is. Okay, I'll stop banging on about that. Ads hafting. Okay, almost done now. This was a, um, an experience I had that that was really quite enlightening for me, okay? That ad's in the middle uh, with the green background. That's the one that I spent four or five hours on. Um, Steve gave the ads to Bruce to go up and cut those notches in it. Um, and... I must admit, I was, uh, Zach can probably, uh, yeah, see him laughing there, that I was a little bit taken aback, you know, because the, the, the uh, traditional way of, of uh, making the Samoan ads is they didn't have those notches in there, okay? Um, but Steve wanted the notches in there. The night that we did the ads hafting, um, Steve enlightened me on that. You can see there on the left, that's a screen grab. There's a, on the YouTube channel for the Museum of Stone Tools, there's a video that we made that night of hafting these adzes. And you can see what those grooves are for. They're for locking in the binding, those first couple of wraps locks in that adz, and there's no way that adz is gonna be able to shift out. And Steve explained to me, he said, you know, when he, he gives these adzes to, um, um, 
prestigious people in it and it's 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 a, an exchange that's very culturally important and it's a a prestigious prestigious exchange and steve explained to me that he can't exchange in ads that even has the remotest possibility that it's going to fall out because that is just not a good look okay totally understandable that you got to do that you got to you got to prepare your ads if you're giving it away as a prestige thing um to show that you've got all that knowledge and you know what you're doing, okay? And so by putting those grooves in there, he's ensuring that the prestige of this ad carries on and his reputation as ads maker uh, is bound to that as it were. Okay, so that's why those grooves are in there. And that's, that's, that's kind of interesting for me because I've experienced the same thing in a different context on another uh, stone flaking workshop that I did with traditional owners up in Cape York, where we spent a lot of time and effort making the axe the traditional way up on Cape York, bifacial axe out of a, a volcanic stone. And we, we cut the handle and heated it over the fire and did the bend around handle and got it all ready to go. And the traditional owners decided that they were going to affix the axe in there using plumber's putty, okay, rather than the traditional ironwood sap. And the reason they did that, it wasn't a prestige thing. It was because they wanted to be able to use this axe with kids. And kids don't know how to use an axe, okay? They wouldn't know the protocols of making sure you use it in a certain way so you don't damage the, the resin. They're going to use the axe, and they're just going to go for it. And they wanted something super robust. So didn't worry them, okay? They, they weren't worried at all about, about using the this plumber's compound. They even use it on their fish spears now up in Cape York. It's wonderful stuff. Um, it's not traditional, but that's not the point. And I guess that's where I'm gonna leave this with is, you know, the purpose of these workshops, you know, I tend to think of these things, I go into them thinking as an archeologist, you know, I'm gonna replicate uh, some aspect of the past um, as an archeological method of scientific analysis of, of learning about um, what happened in the past. That's not necessarily the perspective that uh, traditional people um, are coming into these workshops with, okay? Um, and I think that's that's really important to recognize that the purpose of these workshops is not um, as a, a tool of archeology. span uh, What it tends to be is, is it's more of a tool to revitalize the, um, some of these past practices in, in the modern context. And that's, that's crucially important um, to traditional groups and traditional culture is, you know, making something that's fit for purpose in, in the modern times and the modern generation. And I think this, this workshop and workshops that I, I hope to do into the future, um, uh, thanks to Steve and, and, and those discussions we had over the course of the two weeks and that enlightening uh, comment he made to me when we were doing the, the ads hafting, when we were watching him him and Abu Mula half those ads is. Um, I'm going to be taking that forward into any other workshops uh, uh, if I'm able to do these into the future and making it that clear in my own mind, that much more clear distinction between doing this replication and stuff as an archaeological method um, and how that juxtaposes to how it can be used to revitalize past practices in the modern context. Um, that image at the bottom was one of Steve's Adds is that was given to Leone Village as a thank you for our visit to, to Tonga Matau. So it's, again, stone ads being used in the modern context. Okay, so that's all I have. I just want to acknowledge um, the funding agencies again, especially the ACPEU, um, Creative Industries Grant, um, also the Australian Research Council who helped fund my travel over there. And of course, the Tia Papata Art Center was absolutely wonderful. Again, I emphasize if you ever go to Samoa, definitely drop in. It's beautiful. Uh, people there are great, fantastic place. Um, I've got a list of names there that are associated with the Museum of Stone Tools um, that uh, I'm very grateful for, for their contribution uh, to help keeping that running and Mary Ann made lots of models when we were in Samoa that are slowly appearing in the museum now. And also my colleagues at the University of New England. And I'd also want to exchange, uh, again, uh, great thanks to uh, Stephen, who's, 
who's here in the audience tonight. And thanks, Steve. It was a fantastic experience, one that uh, myself and my students are um, very appreciative of and never going to forget. It's amazing. So thanks. Thanks, Thank Mark. Um, yeah, thank you, Stephen. Um, and oh, and thank you to the other speakers as well, Marianne and um, Zach. Um, Steve Stephen, did you want to say anything? Uh, no, it's it's fine. I mean, you've covered Very a lot of there. bases. Um, a lot of the bases that have been covered by all of you. And it's been a wonderful experience on our side as well to so have that um, level of expertise coming in with, with Mark's knowledge of flint napping and applying it to, I, I knew from the get-go that it was going to be difficult with the oceanic basalt that we have here because I've been trying to nap for a number of years and haven't been very successful. But the Tataka Matau uh, stone was certainly um, more forgiving for the napping, was able to to get flakes off easier than the, the stone that I was trying to work with on this island. So thank you very much for you know, providing that impetus to go out into the field the way we did. Leone has since closed down the access somehow. They've uh, made it clear that no one is allowed there again. I don't know what, what might have... Uh, prompted that, but Epi is, uh, is still working with the village to try and get them to realize the value of that heritage, the importance of the heritage to their identity. So um, I think in the future, I think uh, we might be able to get that door open again um, to, to people going into research there. But thank you. Thank you very much for your contributions to this. Thank Thanks, you, Steve. Are there any questions? I know it's late, but happy to answer questions. Uh, yeah, I don't know if there's an answer for this, but the, the um, making the string from the coconut husks, I wonder just how that could have developed just because there's so many different steps involved. How did they get... You know, <laughs> how did that develop? How did, what was the thinking or the process that, that occurred there? Stephen or Zach? No, I felt. I believe the uh, Samoans actually um, developed the the long, you know, early bioengineers in Samoa were looking for a long fiber. They had no steel to create fasteners of any other kind, you know, to fasten things together. So everything was lashed. So they had to come up with a way of with a way of making this cord to tie things together, and um, they discovered the fiber. Was, was able to be, you know, put together in strands and three or four or five rub, rub, rolled together and then braided. And they had multiple braiding techniques, not just the three strand, which is a very simple one, but they had four, six, eight, 16. They had ropes for the boats that were quite thick and heavy. And they also weaved ma, um, uh, sail sails for for their ocean going vessels. There is a proverb that talks to how you know if the if the wind is very very gusty, they will take down the pandanus sail and hoist the upper sail, the senate sail, because the senate sail was so much stronger. But uh, I think you know Samoa's. You got to got to realize that they had this really strong spirit of inquiry to make their lives better. So they they were, as humans were all over the world, they were always searching for a solution to the problems that they faced. And I think it didn't take very long for them to realize that the Senate, because of its imperviousness to seawater, salt water, 
um, is the only terrestrial plant that is actually impervious to the impact of sea of salt water. They realized that this is the only way they can make a rope that will that will last um, beyond the, the the life of the wood that it's holding together. In many houses, you see the wood is rotted away, but the fiber, the afa fiber is still, and there are proverbs about that as well. So I think that the you got to give credit to the early Samoans who really looked with a scientific mind into how they could make their, their lives better, more comfortable, and find the technology that they needed. Thank you. Took it straight out of my mouth there, um, Steve. <laughs> I, I learned it from you. Any other questions? Oh. Well, um, thank you. I know it's late and I know it's very late for those in Samoa. Um, so thank you everyone for coming along tonight. Um, and hopefully we will have a, another uh, lot of seminar talks next month. So keep an eye out for those. But um, yeah, thank you again and have a have a great night and a great weekend. Georgina. Yeah. It's, it's not a question, but just a, a notice mm -hmm. that um, ABC Radio, the Australian Broadcasting Corporation, Culture Compass is very close to putting out a story about this as well. Okay. As soon as, as soon as we get the um, the link to that, I think they're going to send it um, in advance for a little review, and then yeah. it'll go live on their Culture Compass program. So that would be good. But with this recording, will you be posting that in your um, Facebook or website? Um, I'm not sure where it gets posted to, but it will be made available to um, society members at least. Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you. Yep. All righty. Well, good night, everyone. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, Steve.